Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Black and I'm going to attempt to walk you through this painting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and apologize right off the bat because I'm likely to get in the weeds a little bit on this one and uh, um, definitely have a tendency to ramble and geek it up a little bit. So uh, might as well get that out of the way, just start. Um, starting here with an underpainting using thin burnt sienna. Uh, working light to dark like I would with a watercolor, uh, just really for this stage, the later ones will be the opposite. Uh, I know a lot of artists like to put down contour lines here just to mark where things are going to go, uh, but I actually like to do a rough value study for a handful of reasons. The biggest, biggest one just being sort of a mental trick. Uh, when I start putting color down, I like to be working over the underpainting as opposed to filling in between the lines. It gives me more freedom to make some changes and the marks I've made become a little less precious that way, uh, especially if I feel like changing a drawing later on or just moving something completely. Um, I also, I might as well apologize because I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to have some awkward pauses here. Uh, I'm watching this along with you, so uh, it's all I can do to not heckle the artist in it and, and point out the things I'm doing wrong constantly. So uh, bear with me if you can. Thanks. You'll see coming up here, yeah, so, and here I start actually putting down some color. Uh, I'm just starting to block in the painting, separating the different planes with color families and getting a sense of the different values. Mostly this is about getting the canvas covered at this point and, and getting rid of all that orange tone uh, and getting a sense of what the final sort of color family will look like. I do use a little thinner in this stage just because I'm just trying to build the surface and get it down smoothly. Uh, I want it to evaporate quickly, uh, but leave the surface that's easy to build some thicker layers on later. This stage is where it's easy to fall into the trap of putting down details or taking one part of the painting a little too far. Uh, you just want to get the surface covered and establish the color families. you can see I'm, I'm using sort of darker values of color. Uh, I try and, and block in using medium to darker values of each portion of the painting because everything after the underpainting will be painted dark to light with the thickest buildup being the lightest and brightest values. I don't tend to use a lot of medium in, as I paint. Uh, I do use thinner in the underpainting and then again while blocking in but after that, if I need to break up some really thick paint, I might use a touch of medium or oil. But for the most part, I'm just, you know, using paint applied in different thicknesses. Building thin to thick, fat over lean, so that the bottom layers dry faster than the top. You can see here, I'm... I'm already starting to get a little too fine in the detail where I should just be getting some paint down and uh, trying to get a little gimmicky with that paint is never good for the final painting and it's really just a waste of time. I guess sometimes it can help you figure out some of the things you're going to do later on but for the most part this stage should just be about getting in the larger planes of color. Also a helpful little tip in, in, tip in this stage is um, I do like to pre-mix my different values in the, uh, in the blocking in stage because I like to see how they look laid out on the palette. Uh, it is pretty important to get a general sense of the overall. Uh, like I said, they're going to be a slightly darker shade, but they're not going to be too far off from what the final painting is going to be. Just keyed a little bit darker. Uh, that way, you, you know, you don't end up with something that's just 10 times darker than what you set out to or just way, way too bright to get any real sense of anything that you're trying to achieve, whether it be atmosphere or distance or any of the subtle contrast you have going on.
And because I was a little too fine in the early stages laying down those darker values around the figures, now I have to sort of paint around them. Instead of just sort of layering on top, I'm sort of working around things, which is general what I try and avoid in painting. And believe it or not, still just blocking it in at this point, just sort of getting that canvas covered and for the most part just laying in the really rough planes and figuring things out as you go. Those little lights are always fun. I'm going to go back and paint them dozens upon dozens of times, I'm sure, just in this video. And that's the way it is. It's just you're constantly sort of going back and tweaking, and one thing affects the other. Okay, here's where the real painting starts. Uh, I'm starting to put down intentional strokes that will hopefully end up in the finished piece. Uh, even though this is very low contrast scene, where there's not a lot of vibrancies going on and most of the colors in shadows and in light are harmonious, I still lay down the paint in purposeful brush strokes and try to do very minimal blending on the canvas. But when you're dealing with a scene like this, where there's distance and atmosphere, you do have to keep an eye on your edges. Uh, hard and soft edges in paint, especially with higher contrast, affect the push and pull of a painting and a hard edge will draw the eye and bring whatever you're trying to paint right up to the surface. Uh, and that's the game right there. You're working on a landscape and playing around with a sense of distance and depth. The push and pull, what comes forward and what recedes. Alright, as this painting gets going I can talk a little bit about color and the palette I'm using. Uh, for this painting I'm using what's called an analogous color palette where it's basically just a small range of colors, about three ticks on the color wheel, that make up the majority of the painting, along with one main contrast color that is added to make neutral tones and to create points of vibrancy. Uh, starting with the main color, what some artists might call mother color, that defines the spectrum in which, ev which really affects every other color in the painting. Uh, in this case, it's sort of a red-leaning purple tone, a pink in the lightest values, and the contrast tone is then a yellow-green. Uh, the opposite on the color wheel. This is added to, you know, some of the lightest points to create that neutral values, but then creates real pops of vibrancy at the brightest points. Uh, this type of palette is really useful if you're painting nocturnes or any really low light scenes um, with real minimal value changes. You can sort of get a sense at this point as I'm putting in some different colors. Uh, this video, the camera had a hard time with the auto white balance. And you can see when I'm close to the canvas, the painting reads a lot warmer than when I'm out of frame. Uh, under the daylight bulbs in my studio, which you can see glaring off the top of my shiny bald head, the image is much bluer than in reality. So all the subtle yellows and oranges aren't really coming through. Uh, if I were more tech savvy or patient, I would probably figure this out, but well, maybe for the next one of these I try. Uh, since I'm still taking my time here and figuring things out on the canvas, uh, I'll make a quick note about the composition of the painting, uh, which is probably where I should have started as every painting begins with the composition. Uh, that word, composition, can mean a few different aspects of a painting. Uh, mostly it's the design or layout of the painting, in this case a very basic triangle with the balanced forms at the base. Uh, I don't mind having figures in my painting, even though it creates a static element and the painting becomes a bit of a snapshot, frozen in time. I, I rarely, if ever, have this much movement in the figures, though, so I'm very aware of the tension that creates within the composition. With the figures and people, I think the in, they instinctually draw the viewer's eye, so if you start with the figures in the foreground, follow the hill down, and then run your eye up the center, to those lights in the background buildings, then that to me anyway is an interesting and pleasing composition. I agonized about the placement, body language, and general volume of figures in this painting. 
I did some sketches and played around with different layouts, trying to predict how they would alter or define the implied narrative of a painting. Oh, and that's that's the other aspect of composition that you should figure out in the early stages. Narrative. It's a thesis or idea that you're trying to convey, and painting, all artwork really, in its most basic function is a form of communication. So regardless if it's an abstract or anything else, every painting does have a narrative. All right, we're still sort of in the first pass of the painting here where I'm, you know, still putting down very intentional brush strokes. But with the realization that, you know, a lot of this is going to change, a lot of this is going to get tweaked, something's going to go down at some point where I decide, okay, you know, this needs to be 5% bluer, this needs to be 8% more orange, and it's going to tweak how things go. And that's just a part of painting. Um, the best painters are going to do that unconsciously early on, and they're going to, like anything, it's it's the more you do it, the more you figure it out. So, uh, and this painting, for the most part, went pretty smoothly start to finish. So, there's plenty of paintings I could have videotaped me doing that would have been pure agony, and you would have just seen me scraping down and restarting areas over and over again. That's just the nature of the beast. All right, still in the first stage, but I am starting to put down these little details and, and just sort of figuring out where the lights are going to be and how much contrast and effect they're going to have and what that does to the foreground of the painting. So uh, basically at this stage, once the first pass is really getting going, depending on how successful you are, the stage in which you start adding these little details can be very fun and satisfying, or it can be sort of a torturous game of whack-a-mole. Uh, if the foundation is solid, each little dab of color and texture will bring the painting along and help you envision the final piece. Uh, if the colors and values aren't where you want them, though, each little detail will expose this and mean going back and altering aspects of the painting. Uh, the basis of color theory is that color is based on perspective. Something is warmer or cooler depending on what you're comparing it to. So you might not realize your painting is too blue or too yellow or whatever until you start putting down warmer tones or cooler tones. Uh, it's my experience that there will always be some damage control and some tweaks to the earlier layers that will have to be figured out along the way. Sometimes that means scraping down. Sometimes that means completely rebuilding. And sometimes you can troubleshoot and turn some happy accidents into a success story. But either way, painting is a constant game of problem solving, and that is why it's sort of such a rewarding art form. You're constantly learning, no matter how far along you are. Uh, I'll take something I did in this painting, and you know, either I'll think about it all night, and I'll figure it out, and or it'll be really subconscious, and I'll just know to do it the next time slightly differently, or be wary of keying something one way or another, knowing that it might affect how it looks later on. Uh, particularly when it comes to saturation in colors. I mean, there are some colors, uh, yellow, for example. Yellow is a um, is a tinting color, so it's always going to brighten scenes and lighten scenes, and you take that for granted when you're just trying to add that sort of hue to a color or make something more green or however you're using it. So, And you learn that along the way. See, I can see that I'm putting down some values in the front there to make the, the foreground come forward a little bit. Yeah, the darker points there. I mean, the figures were always going to be way too dark compared to the background, but I wanted to sort of blend them in softly. But I needed that foreground to be sort of grounded and have some weight to it, uh, both to make the composition work, um, also to ground sort of the level of distance. 
which is always going to be a push and pull, especially with a scene that you're trying to create this sort of what I would call like a veil of atmosphere. Like you're looking through something that sort of milky, snowy. It's dark out, but there's just enough snow in the air and light bouncing off of everything that it feels like it's bright's not the right word. It's it's more a lighter tone of value. Everything is low contrast, but something about this, something about the information in scenes like this have always drawn and grabbed my attention, whether it be fog or rain or anything like that. Uh, part of me is thinks it's the mood it creates. Part of me thinks like, you know, finding beauty in things like that as opposed to just a bright sunny day. Uh, I think there's value in that. Uh, part of me thinks it's sort of a celebration of figuring out how to do these things. In the old days, we would have gone out with a, a little French easel and done a little study if we were going to blow it up in the studio like this. But you're not going to do that in the pouring rain or blizzard conditions. So, you know, having to take notes and make these decisions, and I I find a lot of interest in that because you constantly have to sort of relive the scene in your head and, and revisit it in your head and make decisions that aren't going to be simply reacting to something but you need a game plan and you need to execute that game plan and and I do find a lot of value in that the other thing is when you're painting scenes like this you're not necessarily chasing a likeness which uh, if I had to really sum up what I like about the direction I'm taking my painting is is I, I'm very rarely am I interested in capturing a likeness very rarely am I interested in trying to convey something exactly how it is I want to inject subjectivity into it I want to inject mood into it um, if I have to level a huge criticism against myself it's I can't seem to do that without taking a relatively iconic scene um, whether it be a very recognizable landmark or anything else and, and try and tweak it. I'd love to figure out a way to adapt that to the mundane and, and just an everyday scene, but but I'm learning and I'm getting there. And... You can see I keep going back and softening some of these edges and because that's really tough to figure out when you're dealing with these these higher values and these brighter values against these medium tones because you don't want to create any edges you do want to create this sense of softness and atmosphere but at the same time you want some paint on there you don't want it all to be feathered and flat and sort of you know poster looking you you want this to be a dimensional object it's uh paintings are dimensional they you know the surface is where it's at, and it's uh, that surface is is a huge part of the painting. Yeah, there's always going to be some illusion of depth unless you're going for like a Cezanne sort of cubist landscape of some sort. But um, but the surface is really it, it's it's part of the composition as well. It's part of what makes a painting successful or not. Is is you don't want it to be glassy sheen of a photograph. You want it to have dimension. You want it to be sculptural in some sense. Yes, it's technically a two-dimensional scene, but not really. Oh yeah, the lights. The lights are always fun. Uh, the effect can be so rewarding if you get the values right and the colors right. and. Because when you start putting them down, you just know. You either know you're going to have to scrape down half the painting or start fresh. Or, you know, you got them right where you need them to be. Because had that background been too light, then I would have had to key those out way too much and have those those brightest points be way too light of a value. And they're actually not, you know, and it's hard to tell in the video, but um, those values are actually, you know, medium and... And they're not, I mean, there's definitely some titanium white in there, but it's not like they're off whites or shades of white at all. They all have quite a bit of color in them. And if you saw them next to a white, you'd be shocked that they could ever read as, a, as any sort of light source.
and it's funny rewatching this I have a memory of uh, when I was painting it that my fear is that that you know that background was far 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 too dark and seeing it now on this it's it's actually <laughs> it's not bad it's uh, the value seems to be sort of where I'd want it to be maybe that's just the lighting Yeah, the agony of what I'm doing right now is just trying to figure out what's the line. What's the line where there's a little too much detail there? What, when are you taking away from the effect by adding in too much information? I guess that can be said of most aspects of painting. Anyone who's visited my studio can attest I can I keep it pretty cold in there, so if you're wondering why I'm dressed for winter the entire time, it's uh <laughs> part of that is the lights too. The lights warm up the studio pretty fast, so if I'm there for a long day, uh then it can get pretty warm in there too. I've painted the old Hancock building and the new one many times, so I sort of know the layout of the building and the lights, even if it's veiled in snow. Makes it a little easier on me as I'm putting down the lights. Same with the Heritage in the Four Seasons on the left-hand side. The old Taj, what's now the new Newbury. Yeah, and there you can see that changeover from the sort of the white balance on the camera. Still the same lights, you'd never know it. Yeah, keep pushing those a little bit further. It's a balance though. I mean, you really do have to be wary. Like, just looking at those strokes I just put down, those look too light to me now. Probably would have wanted those a little bit more muted. For the painters out there, I'm, I'm using a bristle brush, probably about a number two for most of this. Seems like a relatively big brush for that, but I'm really just touching the edge, so it's not like, you know, I'm going in and making a full brush stroke or anything. I'm really just dabbing a little paint on there. As a general rule, always use a brush that's a little bigger than what you expect you'd need. So It's a good way of, of keeping some of the finer details, unless that's what you're going for, unless you're you're trying to put in as much detail as possible, which is a, a different story, so. I don't know, it's sort of my opinion that we have enough, we have enough machines that can copy things perfectly and take beautiful photographs and do these things where they can get as much information as possible and, you know, megapixels keep going up and everything else, so painting should be a little less about that and more about capturing something more of a subjectivity or, or a mood. <laughs> Good little trick to figure out if your lines are straight, if you're not using, I mean, some people might, I might have, you know, five years ago I might have put a grid down at that when I was starting this painting as opposed to just freehanding it all, but I know the tricks, and sometimes the tricks mean just tilting it on its side or looking at it in a mirror or anything else to sort of help you figure out if, um, if any of your line work is straight. Sometimes you can just get too close to a picture, and I don't mean physically too close. I mean, that's obviously an issue. You do want to stand back from it pretty regularly, but when you spend too much time with a painting regardless, even if you think you're coming back with fresh eyes the next day, it's good to see it from a new angle or a new perspective whenever you can. And now I'm sort of fleshing out those figures, and I remember thinking, you know, I wasn't going to do that till the, the 
almost the painting is finished and which means that I must be getting pretty close now um, each of these figures is the last sort of stage in the painting to, for me and uh, um, most of them are almost gone from the issues drawing in the back so I still have to put in all the figures that are in there and like I said earlier I, I agonized about the volume of figures and when I first laid it out I was gonna have dozens of figures in there walking down the paths and uh, because when I was out there it was a busy night in Boston but I thought that sort of took away from the just how snowy it was that that sort of late night snowy and it really wasn't that late it was probably you know this would be somewhere between eight and nine o'clock at night on February so it's been dark for a couple hours but not you know outrageously so um, but there even though there were a lot of people out there sledding I thought just having a handful of people to focus on really sort of captured what I was trying to do in the painting and, and if I loaded it up too much it just would look I, I don't know the figures would be too dominant and they would they would be the focal point of the painting it would be about the figures and I didn't necessarily want that to be the case I wanted to just start with the figures have some motion in those figures and sledding down the hill is certainly a huge aspect of the narrative of the painting but I didn't want to keep you from that background that sort of all the sparkly wintry you know veil of of lights yeah I think I must be getting pretty close to done at this point I see a few more figures that need to go in there but um one note nobody's going to find much interest in this beyond me but um uh years ago i saw a painting by um a canadian artist lauren harris that was done in winter that was a lot of pinky sort of gray neutral tones that i absolutely loved and the lightest tones were these little hints of green and i'd, I'd been wanting to try and tackle something in that palette that that warmth of winter um for a long time and when I was out on the common and I was looking at this scene I, I realized that's exactly how I wanted to paint it because that's exactly how it looked it was a pinky purple scene and I was very excited to paint this painting and, I, and I'm glad I'm finally done with it um, but I had to wait the better part of a year to do this because I painted several scenes of kids sledding on the common last uh, last winter but it was a, a late point in the winter because it was a couple late storms last February and I realized nobody, including myself, really wanted to look at snow come March. So um, the anticipation of wanting to tackle this painting was nearly a year long. So anyway, that about wraps it up for me. Um, uh, I'm going to sign this in a couple seconds, I'm sure. So that means we're just about done. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this and... If you're interested in painting, I hope you might have learned some little trick or something else, but uh, most of all, I just hope you get a kick out of the fast forward. So anyway, until the next time, thanks.